Welcome back to Decouple. Today, I am joined by a man who truly does need no introduction as he is such a regular here on the Decouple podcast. And uh, I think there's a huge crossover in listenership between our two podcasts. Robert Bryce of the Power Hungry podcast. Welcome back to Decouple. Thanks a lot, Chris. Always happy to be with you. So, Robert, um, we were just texting back and forth, um, and I also follow your Substack, as everybody who listens here should do as well. Um, and notice that Robert, Robert uh, Bryce.substack.com. Let's oh. let's get that out there right there. <laughs> got to get the marketing up. Robert Bryce.substack.com, Doctor Kiva. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got it loud and clear now. Um, so you have uh, completed uh, not quite a pilgrimage, but you've been to one of the countries that I'm very eager to uh, to uh, you know get off my bucket list, and that is Japan. Um, so first off, welcome back, um, and you know, second off, that's that's going to be the topic uh, of our discussion today. Sure. Well, thanks. Uh, yes, I, I was in Japan two weeks ago and was there for a total of two weeks, and. Uh, it was a remarkable experience. I mean, you know, people say it's life changing. Uh, you know, it, it was definitely career altering. I think and kind mm. of thought thought provoking. I'll put it that way. Um, Absolutely. I'd been to Japan once before, but uh, you know, it's one thing to talk about Fukushima Daiichi. It's another thing to go there. Yeah, absolutely. And we will get into that. Um, I mean, I share your fascination with this country. I think we could both be accused of being energy maximalists or energy determinists, or certainly we love to look at how energy explains and underpins, uh, you know, historical phenomena, modern phenomena, et cetera. Uh, but I, I find Japan absolutely uh, astoundingly interesting. I mean, this is a country, I think, where that energy determinism is accompanied by sheer willpower. Like when you uh, understand a bit of the history and this Meiji restoration where Japan went from a feudal society um, to within 37 years, basically wiping out the entire Russian naval fleet, um, you know, from <laughs> really no steel in the country to building battleships and sinking, uh, you know, a, a pretty advanced nation's uh, naval fleet, you know, another 35 years and we're in World War II. Um, and Japan's building uh, state of the art aircraft carriers and fighters that, uh, you know, rival that of the U.S. Obviously, as a country, they're unable to outproduce the U.S., but, you know, just just extraordinary. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the energy uh, situation in Japan. Um, but again, just a fascinating, fascinating country. We have a great episode with Yuri Humber. People want to check out the archives. We may repost it as a compliment to this episode. It's called The Energy Transitions in Japan. Um, and it, it really, uh, I think, does an excellent job to underpin some of what we're going to talk about today. Um, but Robert, where do you want to get started? Um, you wrote a great Substack piece. We could use that as the, uh, <clears throat> as the architecture here, really wherever you want to start. I'm sure, uh, we'll find lots of stuff and ways to interject. Sure. Well, I, I did, I did write two pieces while I was in Japan. One, uh, called at Fukushima Daiichi and the other was Japan no Kyoto. So maybe we just take them in order. Um, you know, Chris, we both heard a lot about Fukushima Daiichi and the earthquake, but, and it's one thing to hear about it. And it's one thing to think about what the damage was in the prefecture. And I was fortunate to talk to my friend Jesse Osterbell before I left. And he he reminded me, he said, you know, everybody talks about the nuclear accident and it was an accident. It's it's going to be dealt with now for, for decades to come. But people forget, and and this is the critical point, there were not, something like 19,000 people, 19,000 Japanese people died, drowned in a span of about 10 minutes. Not one person died of radiation, not one. No one is even hurt. No one is even injured by radiation. And so to go drive through the prefecture and see the, it was kind of a ghost town, you know, and see all these abandoned buildings and all these abandoned homes and businesses and uh, um, how many parts of the area had just been swept clean, right? Some of them, some of them had washed out to sea, others that they'd just been leveled because of damage to the buildings. But that was the, you know, one of the most immediate and most immediate things that I thought about before we even got to the plant and then going to the plant and, you know, you and I are both adamantly pro-nuclear. I mean, have been for a long time, but it made me come to realize or come to grips with, well, if things go bad, they can go bad really badly. And when they go bad badly, they, I mean, it, it they're talking about a decades long cleanup and some areas in the, in the area were right near, particularly reactor number one radiation levels are very high. You can't stay there for more than a few, you know, we were allowed to stay there a few minutes. Now workers could stay there a few hours or so, but only on a very clear rotating basis. So, um, but that, and, and also to see one other thought of, that was really impactful was we, we got to drive around in a bus and see the, the site itself, which isn't very big. 
but you and I have heard about a thousand tanks of treated water, right? They right, run through right. the Alps process, right? Where they're stripping out all the nuclides and, and so on and, and, and leaving this very weak concentration of tritium in this water that they still want to release into the ocean hasn't begun yet. But it's over a thousand tanks. It's easy to say a thousand tanks, but when you see it and you see row upon row upon row upon row of these tanks all waiting to be, you know, 1.3 million cubic meters. I mean, it's just a massive, massive amount. So uh, that was very sobering. I think that that's the right word for the visit. It didn't really change my long-term view on nuclear, but it was one that made it clear to me that this requires deep care and it requires a level of sobriety about how we think about it and how we as a society, looking at what Japan has happened in Japan, how we consider it and what are the risks and how we have to be very clear about them. I've been thinking a lot about this. We had Jack Devaney on a little while ago. Um, he's the author of Why Nuclear Energy Has Been a Flop. And one of the things that he documents in terms of a, you know, a grand error in terms of how the nuclear industry has communicated um, is basically to accept the idea that a nuclear accident is an utter catastrophe. You know, this was based upon some early studies, uh, like I think with the WASH 700 report, which said, you know, 70,000 people would die from the fallout of a nuclear accident, which actually their modeling released less radionuclides than Chernobyl. And we now know that, uh, you know, the, the deaths uh, from Chernobyl are, are under 100 and there's not really many more expected. Um, but basically their approach was to say that, you know, to accept that, that a catastrophe would be that, um, but say, you know, it's have the hubris to say basically it's but it's impossible for there to actually be a nuclear meltdown. Um, and I think, you know, Japan's a living example of that because a lot of the response um, in order to buy public trust, they actually reduced um, the acceptable limits of a bunch of radionuclides and you know regulatory limits about how much uh, radiation could be in water or food. Um, and, you know, in one sense, maybe that does um, show some, uh, you know, extra efforts and restore some confidence. But on the other, it, it does make things more scary and it does result in a cleanup, which is, um, you know, in my humble opinion, uh, very excessive. Like you look at them and I don't know what you saw here, but you hear about them, you know, stripping the topsoil off of fields and putting it in big plastic bags. You know, when that level of, of radiation and it's no different than natural uh, radiation is, you know, you'd be doing that to, uh, you know, Denver, Colorado, or certainly, you know, stripping all the beaches off of Kerala, India, you know, in terms of the actual health impacts and and the decision making around spending hundreds of billions of dollars, cleaning it up to a level of natural background radiation, that's frankly, very low. Um, and even again, like, I'm trying to think as well of, you know, that visualization of these tanks of water. I mean, do they need to be holding that water there? They really don't once it's the, de de uh, you know, gone through the, al the ALPA process you were mentioning. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a monument to our, our nuclear fears um and and really again the consequences of i think the industry um and the regulatory bodies taking a uh you know a very unique approach to nuclear and that's my sermon from the mountain no no no. well I'll, I'll take all your points i think they're 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 well taken but japan has a different relationship with nuclear than any other country in the world as well mm. and we did some interviews for uh our documentary tyson Culver met me over in tokyo and we we went over together and i was uh I was very lucky to go with the uh, Washington Policy, uh, uh, Washington Policy and Analysis, a group that was uh, created by Bill Martin, and uh, we were guests of the. You know, the trip was sponsored by the Japanese utilities, but we talked to people, and you know, in, both in government and in industry, and not every one of them, but most of them. You know, when you take them aside and say, "Well, what's really going on here?" and they, you know, they will mention Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and they yeah, say, yeah. you know, this is a different. The culture is different because of this background or this 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 backdrop of being the only country ever to experience uh, being hit with nuclear weapons, and and that also to remember that the the support for nuclear was very high in Japan prior to the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. And then after the accident fell dramatically, well, now it's rebounding. And so they've restarted 10 reactors. And a lot of this is simply due to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the spike in LNG prices. And and I think, you know, the, we can talk about, you know, the Kyoto Protocol in a minute. But, you know, all of this backdrop is kind of, and all of that history in some ways has been discarded because now, in you know, as a very industrialized society, one that depends on making things, shipping them out, you know, and producing things, they are not, climate change is not their concern. I mean, they, they've made that very clear, you know, that this, especially after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that 
they're nowhere no, near meeting the, the the terms of the Kyoto Protocol. And and I live in Austin, Texas. I see more electric cars here than I saw in my entire time in Japan. I mean, I didn't see but one or two or three or four EVs in Tokyo. And we spent almost the entire trip in Tokyo. You know, it's it's fascinating looking at that period of the, uh, the shutdown of the Japanese fleet. Um, I mean, you want to talk about the energy shock in Europe. I think something very comparable happened in Japan. You know, nuclear was 30% of their electricity generation. They left a couple plants on because they would have blacked out one of their prefectures. Uh, but they got everything shut down by 2014. Um, and the estimates are they spent an extra $100 billion um, in added fuel costs uh, for fossil fuels to make up that shortfall. You know, ran some of the most stringent demand management programs you ever heard of, shutting off elevators and high-rise buildings and making people take the stairs. I mean, returning to that earlier theme, I'm an energy determinist, but there's something going on in Japan with the sheer willpower um, yeah. of the Japanese people, whether it's, you know, the most rapid industrialization, I think, in human history um, or, you know, you know, soldiering on through, um, you know, kind of a self-imposed energy shock. Um, did you hear any other sort of stories of, of, of the consequences of, of the shutdown and the kind of, yeah, it's just the self-imposed, uh, energy shock. It's, it's fascinating. Sure. sure. Well, and remember this has been ongoing for years now and in nearly every establishment you go in, they say, you know, there are signs saying, you know, turn off the lights, you know, save energy. And this has been some, you know, part of the culture. And remember, this is also a very homogeneous culture. There are very, there's very little in migration into Japan you know, there are, um, you know, you, you don't see a lot of, of, of mixed race, you know, you don't see black folks. You don't see, I mean, I live in Texas, you know, I, used to seeing different races of people. I was in, Lauren and I went birding yesterday and we were remarking in a, a suburb here in, in Wells Branch, north of Austin. We saw Indian folks, we saw black folks, we Latinos. I mean, you know, it, it's a very diverse community, right? That doesn't, you don't see that in Japan. And so there is also this very, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> feeling of responsibility. My friend Yuichi talked about it that, or no, my friend Kosuke Furutachi, um, who works for Nip, uh, Nippon Oil, he said, in Japan, we always think about everyone else first, right? You make sure everyone else is comfortable. And so if for an exam, as an example, you know, you know all about COVID and masking and the rest of it in Japan, nearly everyone is wearing masks on the street still. I mean, wow. you know, so outdoors. outdoors. And so the mask mandates were still in place in Japan. And you know, I'm I'm over the mask thing. I'm just over it. I'm I, like, feel you. I I get outside, and the first thing I do is take my mask off. But not so for, I would say, ninety percent of the Japanese people we saw, even outside at Tokyo Station, they were wearing masks. Maybe ninety five percent. Only a handful of people were not wearing masks. So, that's indicative of this kind of, I say, esprit de corps. I'm looking for the right term that you know to to reflect the Japanese society of, of their sense of themselves. Right. And, and it's not anything like that kind of, a, you know, here in Texas in particular, well, you know, screw you, I've got mine, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. Right. None of that, that doesn't exist there as far as I can tell. I think, you know, we both uh, have admiration for the work of Peter Zihan and, and a lot of that stems from his analysis of demography. Uh, yeah. Just, just an off the cuff question again. Um, sure. I hope to see it for myself, but did you notice that there's very few young people as you made your way around, you know, crowded cities like Tokyo, or you couldn't tell because they all had masks on? Well, no, I mean, we saw kids and, and, and young families, definitely. But we also saw a lot of old people and a lot of very old people. Um, and this is one of the things I, uh, I bring up my friend Kosuke again. He was very kind. We, he, he got, we went to a Kabuki theater in Tokyo uh, two, two or three weeks ago. It was just amazing. I mean, just amazing, the theater and the movement of some of the actors. Just incredible. I didn't understand the word they were saying, but it was just incredible. But he talked about this, about the demographic issue and about, particularly for Nippon Oil, where they're planning on closing one of the refineries because demand is going down, right? Because cars are more efficient, but they have fewer and fewer people. And so they're facing this demographic uh, time bomb. And I said, what are you going to do about it? He said, well, we're not going to allow more. They're, they're not going to allow, his view was, they're not going to allow more immigration. So what are they going to do? They're going to do it with, they're going to keep up robots. with robots is one of the things that he said. <laughs> they're going to really try and increase automation. And uh, that this is one of their strategies as they look at the future and the future of energy. But I think the other key part here, Chris, I mean, to get back to the electricity start, uh, side of this is, and it's what I wrote about in this piece, uh, uh, Japan no Kyoto, the, they're, they're, they're building, yes, they've restarted some reactors and they're going to restart some others, but they're building a total of 7.3 gigawatts of coal and gas fired capacity right now. I mean, it's it's <laughs> this, this kind of dystopian robot based future. You can just imagine like an elder's care home and, uh, you know, these little 
you know, large eyed uh, humanoid uh, robots coming out. Of course, they run on juice, on electricity. And you want to talk about fuel uh, diversity. I mean, good old fashioned food and people is probably a, a pretty good thing as well. Um, but, you know, as you said, uh, they've been building a lot of new coal infrastructure. Um, you know, that's that's the real baddie when it comes to, to climate change. I mean, the whole history of this island, um, as far as I can tell, uh, is intimately tied up with a question of energy security. Um, you know, Yuri, uh, again, Yuri uh, Humber, who we had on to give us a background on Japan, he mentioned that the reason they built those nuclear plants in uh, the Fukushima prefecture is that that used to be a major source of their coal. Um, and if you think about it, there's no breakneck industrialization if you don't have coal. And they weren't importing coal in the early days, you know, as they, they in 35 years, they industrialized their country, but they ran out of it. Um, so, I mean, what's your understanding of, um, you know, what, what their options are? I've heard Japan, uh, this was maybe a couple of years ago, but the largest LNG importer in the world. Um, tell, tell me a little bit more about the kind of energy context of, of Japan's energy security. Sure. Well, this is one of the things before I left, I, you know, tried to do my homework um, to, you know, make sure I was really ready to, you know, with good questions and good focus with the, because we had meetings with uh, ATINA, the Atomic Energy uh, Association. We had meetings with the uh, Federation of Electric Power Co Companies. We had meetings with top level government people at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ministry of Econom uh, Economy, Technology and Industry. And these are high level people. And I'll just but preface this to get before I get to the coal thing. I, I in every one of the meetings, and including when we met with J uh, Japan Nuclear Fuel Limited, and the people at TEPCO Tokyo Electric Power, I said, "Give me your best, your most optimistic scenario under the most the blue sky." It for me. When will Japan build another new nuclear reactor? Every one of them said fifteen to twenty years. There was no one that was more optimistic. Now, you know, Canada. You're obviously, you're, you're refurbishing your reactors. You're building the new. Uh, uh, small SMR, uh, the BWRX 300, you know, you're moving ahead and, and, but in Japan, no. And so what are they doing? Well, before I left, I, you know, I'd noticed that w w this news clip. So they're right in central Tokyo today in a, there's a, a coal fired power plant called Yokosuka that is being built, uh, by TEPCO, which is the, uh, and in association with Chubu, I guess it's owned by JIRA is the acronym 1.3 gigawatts, a new coal fired power plant in the middle of Tokyo. And it's going to be an ultra supercritical plant. But you you take that that facility, and then there's one other. I've just looked it up here. There's another 500 megawatt facility being built uh, by Shikoku Electric Power. So there's 1.8 gigawatts of coal fired capacity and 5.5 gigawatts of new gas fired capacity being built now in Japan. So 7.3 gigawatts of new uh, new hydrocarbon infrastructure being built at the same time that they have what 20 or 30 reactors that are still offline. So Japan is being, they are very candidly saying, and they, in the meetings, they, you know, I, in fact, one of the, the, the government officials I, I talked to, I said very clearly, he said, yeah, this is the, this is the reality or no, this was a guy from TEPCO. He said, this is the energy reality in Japan today. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm under no delusion that, you know, something with such an upfront high capital cost as nuclear is going to be built for, for climate reasons. It's going to happen for, you know, people are you know, in Japan, maybe they're going to be forced kicking and screaming and maybe they are. Um, to a return to restarts here um, because uh, of that very reliance on overseas, uh, you know, uh, coal and natural gas. Um, I mean, you saw you were documenting the, the, the spiking of coal prices um, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, you know, LNG prices, uh, you know, are obviously very volatile. I think the Japanese try these long term contracts to, you know, recognizing that long term dependence they'll have. But that's a real, real vulnerability. Um, in terms of that, you know, 15, 20 years to to build a new, yeah, and ahead. they couch that too in in not just in price but in geographic terms, you know. And m many of them said, you know, look, we live in a bad neighborhood here. We yeah. got North Korea, we got Russia, we got China. We don't have any friends nearby, right. and so it's this. Uh, I, I looked. It was my friend from TEPCO. I showed him the list of power plants, which you can you can get on a Japanese website if you're nowhere to look. But he also said you'll never see this in the Japanese newspapers. They won't report on it. Um, but he said, yes, this is the reality today in Japan. And so, you know, they are looking at it. There's a, a, a geographic security issue, but there's an energy security issue as well. And so, and then they have a lot of heavy industry, a lot of, you know, steel and, and, and automaking, you know, all the things we know about. So this is, Japan is going to take care of Japan first. And, and the impact of the nuclear accident, it, it, 
is very deep and and but even deeper i think in fact when we were at the tokyo international forum right there in central tokyo right next to tokyo station on the day we visited there was a an exhibit of the the people who had been killed in fukushima by the tsunami and the earthquake and so this is still very much that history now of 3 11 11 it's not that long ago and it's still very much present today I mean, getting back to that question of demography, um, something I'm, I'm very concerned about in terms of a nuclear revival in Japan is that, you know, the population is not getting any younger. There's fewer and fewer, you know, 30, 40, 50 year olds um, as time marches on. And that nuclear re uh, workforce has, you know, been sidelined uh, for what, the last 10 years. Um, yeah. It's, you know, that's that's one of the big lessons and one of the advantages, you know, say we have in Ontario is that we have a very active um, and large and highly skilled uh, workforce that's there's no atrophy going on there but I, I do that's one of my concerns anyway about uh japan's ability to restart yeah i hadn't thought about i hadn't thought about that but yeah i mean that that does figure right into the labor issues and you know it's something by the way i mean just to bring it back to the u.s i was in washington uh well it was it last week or the week before i'm losing track of time since i got back from japan but uh, i spoke at a nuclear energy institute event and there was a supplier there he worked with a company i've forgotten the name of the uh, their precision manufacturer and they provide components to the nuclear sector and i said what's your biggest challenge he said finding labor you know so this you know we're particularly machinists mechanics blue collar guys that's what we need we can't find them and so this is something that's not unique to japan but it's also here in the u.s very much as well in terms of these skilled laborers that are going to be needed for the next phase of manufacturing and industrial output in the United States and around the world. <laughs> I really think, uh, in, especially in the context of AI now uh, threatening a lot of, uh, you know, cognitively heavy or intellectual work um, that the skilled trades uh, as, as a career choice are going to kind of inherit the earth to some degree. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see what yeah, happens so to wages, I, I, uh, right. you know, welders and electricians and, you know, pipe fitters. <laughs> Auto mechanics, um, hot commodity. Auto, auto mechanic, auto mechanics. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. You know, window installers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, Japan has uh, made some lofty commitments. I think you were documenting the number of municipalities uh, that have signed on to net zero declarations. It's being celebrated by in Davos by the World Economic Forum as a country that's taking a lot of action. I mean, first, um, update us on <laughs> the uh, the truth of those claims or lack thereof. Uh, and also, you know, what are Japan's options other than nuclear for decarbonization? Well, as I said before, you know, the, <clears throat> in, in just, just walking the streets of Tokyo, right. And looking around, well, where are the electric cars? I didn't see any, I didn't see any charging stations. I see more of those here in the U S than I saw in Japan. And remember, this is the home, home of the Kyoto Protocol, which of course is the first of the, of the, uh, the big, well, at first, and probably the most important of the, all the the climate confabs was the one that happened in Kyoto, uh, gosh, it was 26 years ago. Um, but, you know, for all of the talk about net zero, and as I pointed out, I think, what is it? In, and there are something like 281 cities lo and local governments have declared net zero by 2050. Easy to declare, eh, Robert? <laughs> yeah, easy to say. Easy to say, Dr. Kiefer, but very hard to do. And this is on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. And then they go on saying this covers more than 100 million people or 80% of Japan's population. So they're mouthing the words about this. But the reality is that, you know, you look and just looking with my own eyes around what is going on and what are people saying and what are people doing? And it's just two completely different things. And it's very similar, I think, here to the situation in the United States, uh, you know, where there's a lot of talk about the energy transition and so on and so forth. But the reality is quite different. Okay, but hold on here, Robert, because I was uh, I was doing some sleuthing, looking at some stats, and I learned that Japan has the most solar panels deployed per square meter meter of any country on the earth. I think seventy five gigawatts. For context, Germany has installed sixty gigawatts. I'm not sure how they compare in terms of uh, their uh, solar resources, their capacity factors, but I mean that's that's a remarkable number. Oh, I yeah. mean, is it littering the country? I mean, uh, do you, do you see these things everywhere? Well, no, I'm not going to uh, profess to be an expert on Japan, you know, and we spent, you know, we but went just, to just traveling property. through it. Did you see right. a lot? We, we saw a lot. Yeah, sure. But I also talked to my friend, uh, uh, Yuichi, uh, Furutachi and, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Yuichi, uh, Watanuki, he works for Kyushu Electric. He said, they're not, a, they're not connecting any more renewables to their grid. They, he said, we, we, we tapped out. We can't, we can't manage anymore. 
So yes, your numbers are right. They had <clears throat> BP data, 75 gigawatts of installed capacity. They tripled solar um, uh, generation between 2014 and, and 2021. Um, but they, you know, they're reaching the limits of the system because Japan, you know, their geography is not very good either, right? It's a small, it's a very densely populated island. They have a lot of mountains. And they so they can't build much wind. Its wind is unpopular, and they're reaching the limits of the public acceptability on solar as well. And and also it, with that, as you know, it's not just the public. You know, it's Lee Cordner's old line: Where are you going to put it? How are you going to connect it? How are you going to pay for it? So not only do they have the, the limits of the ex public acceptability, they can't connect it. They can't build you know build more high voltage infrastructure. And this was one of the things I did a short video when I was in Japan in Hakone, you know, that Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory puts out a study. Says, well, if Japan, if all everything's great, they'll can go to 90% renewables. Well, yeah, if you just ignore all the physical constraints on the system, you could, but you can't. And that's one of the things that they're facing. Any issues at all? You mentioned uh, Japan being in a pretty unfriendly neighborhood um, about where all that solar comes from. Does that factor at all into their decision making around putting some limits on it now? Did they care about the Uyghurs, anything like that? Or is it more I, I didn't. I didn't hear much. I mean, I talked with some of my friends about the, you know, the China, you know, supply issue. And, and they're, you know, it's, you know, when I would mention China it, to my friends from Japan, they all just, this kind of look came over their face like, oh, yeah. Mm. You yeah. know, they're, China and Japan have a long history and all of it's bad. And so... You know, they're very aware of their supply chains, uh, whether it's oil and gas, coal, you name it. They're very aware and very um, concerned about it. So another um, big part of the stated climate plans of Japan, as I understand it, is hydrogen um, talks with, I think, Australia about becoming, you know, a, a big supplier of, of, of hydrogen, that hydrogen could somehow swap in um, and play the role that LNG is to facilitate a climate transition. How, I mean, I think you and I both have pretty clear opinions on this um, that are pretty informed by by science and, and engineering discipline. But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, because I, I assume that the Japan political class is less um, of a uh, clown show than, you know, the, <laughs> the political representatives in our respective countries who tend to be, you know, lawyers um, and folks without much. <laughs> you, you set a low bar, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 it strikes me as strange. I mean, any country that has, that you know, got uh, a lot of energy delusions may, built into it. But, I mean, maybe use hydrogen as an example. There. I don't expect you to be an expert on, you know, the Japanese political class. But within what you know, um, what, what's, the, what's the case for hydrogen in Japan as, as some kind I of didn't, I didn't. He I didn't hear much talk about hydrogen. I mean, there were some... Um, I think from what I gathered in talking with people in government and, and in industry, there's more, there's a, a, a bigger push on for carbon capture and sequestration because I think they see that as a more viable possibility. Um, you know, I'm a long time, you know, skeptic on hydrogen. I, I have a piece that I've been thinking about for Substack and I'll, I'll give you the title. The H stands for hype. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Well, Robert, any other any other insights from your trip or anything else that you covered in your article? I, I feel like we've got a good a good sense of things now. But well, I think the you know the the main things to me still are you know how Japan. Oh, the, well, this is this is another I think an important thing that we it deserves a, a, the discussing as well. And it was one of the sobering parts of my visit, which was seeing how committed the Japanese utilities are to the future of nuclear, <clears throat> despite all the things we've talked about. So. One of the things we did uh, as the group, Washington Policy and Analysis, we went to the Japan Nuclear Fuel Limited facility in Amori Prefecture. And this was impressive, Chris. I mean, I've been, as my father used to say, to a county, care, a county fair and a goat roping. I've, I've, you know, I've seen industrial facilities. They're spending $20 billion, the, 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 10, nucle the 10 utilities in Japan, $20 billion on an integrated uh, fuel supply chain in Amori Prefecture. So they have a high-level disposal facility, a low-level disposal facility. They have an enrichment plant. They have, and they're building a reprocessing plant. So in this massive facility, I mean, just massive, covering a couple square miles, they are trying to integrate their entire fuel cycle within. With uh, they'll have everything they need except the uranium input. Right, so they'll 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 take the enriched. They'll they'll get some. Uh, you know, I don't know all my terms. I need to understand the fuel supply cycle better. But they need to import the ore or the refined ore, and then they can do everything else after that. And so, despite the near term issues, right, of not being able to open as many reactors as they want, and they're going to try and open more over time, and that's going to take a while. 
But in the meantime, the JNFL is building this entire infrastructure to be ready because there is a very clear sense. And we interviewed Nabuo Tanaka, who's the former head of the IEA in Tokyo, uh, Masakazu Toyota, who's been a high-level guy in the nuclear in the energy sec- sector in, in 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 Japan for decades, and there was a sense among all the people we talked to, the inevitability of nuclear in Japan, and that was all kind of understood. And the and the utilities, they're only and this is the other key thing, there are only ten of them, right? But they're all coming together behind JNFL to have this integrated fuel supply system because they know the future of, of, of Japan has to be nuclear in a big way. So this was the, I mean, so that's the uh, kind of a long preamble, but to me, the key part of the, why that matters, particularly for the United States, is we don't have that close alignment between government and industry that Japan does. And, 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 and you know, you can argue, well, that's good, or you can argue that's bad. But I'm walking or, you know, thinking about and seeing J- JNFL getting, you know, seeing all this industry and all this infrastructure. And I'm thinking, could this happen in the United States? And my near term answer is hell no, it couldn't because we can't get any, you can't get all these guys to sing from the same hymnal. I mean, you know, on pretty much anything because it would be such an enormous commitment of capital and resources. But that's what, if the U.S. is going to be, I think you have a, an advantage in Canada toward all of this because you have a more integrated system in terms of the nuclear and the industry and the government and so on. But I don't see a system here in the U.S. where we can get on the same page for anything like that. So it's a, I've talked for a long time about this, but I think I want to make sure I put this in context because the scale of what the JNFL is doing is impressive. I mean, really impressive. And I, you know, driving around and I'm thinking, man, the U.S. needs this, right? But it doesn't. And could it happen? Well, maybe, but it's going to take decades. Well, it needs it in a hurry, especially with, uh, you know, Russian supplies of enriched uranium dropping off. I think 20, 25 percent of the U.S. fleet's uh, enriched fuel exactly. is, is sourced from Russia, the HALU for this whole advanced generation. Uh, U.S. has got to get cracking. Speaking of uh, the Russian invasion, because you mentioned this before, you view that as, I think, a real turning point in terms of the pragmatism um, yeah. of Japan's decision making. Um and any comments on that from folks that you talk to, or I believe that there's a big gas field that uh, Japan has some um, contracts with, uh, and they're a little worried that Russia could pull uh, uh, the same move it did on Europe, um, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, any any comments or? I, I haven't heard about the latter about the gas field, but the but the, the Russia invasion was top of mind in in nearly all the conversations we had in all of these meetings that we had. Um, and, and when I, uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, I, I, I can't speculate, but in terms of the gas fields or whatever, but you know, every, in addition to pointing to the Russia, Ukraine conflict and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, it, it, all of the, you know, that, that was the other repeated, we don't have any natural resources here. You know, we, we have to import pretty much everything. Um, but I want to jump back to the fuel supply issue because that was the other thing at going to JNFL and then watching what's happening here in the U.S. with all the uh, the SMRs that are are being proposed that are in various stages stages of, of dealing with the NRC. And, and by the way, there was another similarity between Japan and the U.S. They, they, their group, their agency is called the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, NRA. But also within government and within industry, the attitude toward the NRA in Japan was very similar to our, the attitude toward the NRC in the United States, was that, well, here's this intractable, independent agency and they are making things hard for us and just increasing the amount of friction. But back to the fuel thing, because this was the other thing that I, you know, going and seeing actually the centrifuges and I'd never seen them before. I'd seen pictures of them and trying to figure out, okay, well, how tall are they? You know, I'm asking all the right. questions. Well, how big are they? Well, we're not going to tell you how fast are they spent. We're not going to tell you how much <laughs> deeper. We're not going to tell you, you know, because this is, these are closely guarded, this closely guarded information. But I was thinking, well, the U.S. now we're kind of stuck in terms of build, deploying new SMRs because we don't have a solid su- su- fuel supply chain. You got it in Canada. I mean, you know, it's amazing. You know, your advantage over the U.S. How are we going to deal with that? And ha- in the near term, ha- where are we going to get these tons of tens of tens of metric tons of Halo? Who's going to make the triso? Where is it going to come from? Where who you know? T- tell me, you know, because I hear a lot of talk about it, but I don't see 
this clear line to see where that is going to happen. And one of the questions put to the, the, the our hosts at JNFL when we were in the enrichment plant was, could you make HALU if you had authority to do it? They said, sure, we can make it. We don't have the regulatory approval to make it, but if we got it, yeah, we can enrich it to whatever level you want. But, you know, contrast that with the United States where we're still looking around trying, well, how, where is it going to come from? And no one's kind of, you know, everybody's looking around, well, we think it's going to come from here, but I need to, I need to understand this better. I'm going to do more, another podcast and find somebody I'm going to have on to talk about it. Maybe Dan Poneman from Centris to get it, do a deeper dive on this, because this is the, what are the two main obstacles? I talked to a guy, shut up after this point, but with one of the SMR companies, he was here in Austin just the other night. I said, what do you see the two big hurdles? He said, the NRC and the fuel. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned uh, the NRA, and let's be clear, this is not the National Rifle Association. This is, I think, the Nuclear Regulatory Authority uh, in Japan um, and the frustration that it's uh, behaving in a similar way as the NRC. I mean, as I understand it, the regulatory agency before Fukushima was a lot like the Atomic Energy Commission. It was tasked both with the promotion and regulation of nuclear, and, and there was a feeling that that conflict of interest had in some way contributed to the poor sighting of the the diesel generators or a lack of enforcement on moving those, which in turn led to the accident. So, uh, you know, understandable that they would pivot towards a more stringent regulatory framework. Um, but I, I don't know if you share this opinion, Robert. I think, um, you know, as hard as as I, I fight for nuclear energy, I do feel it's inevitable um, simply from, you know, these pragmatic concerns. Again, not not because of climate change, but because of, you know, real energy security imperatives. You know, if, if Japan, um, you know, Took the hit and and you know knocked thirty percent of their power generation out. Um, did this stringent demand management. Um, it's not that people's opinions in Japan, I think, have changed that much in terms of the global population. Um, it's this it's this pragmatic understanding that they need it. And you know, as fossil fuels inevitably become somewhat constrained or more pricey or harder to access because of geopolitics, um, you know, that's where nuclear makes its resurgence. And and that's where I think regulations, um, there will be flexibility at some point. I, I don't have a lot of um, uh, a lot of optimism that's going to happen in the U.S. anytime soon because you got a lot of energy resources. There's not really an imperative to deploy nuclear other than it's kind of cool. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, very bearish on, on the U.S., as you probably know. But um, I think Japan, uh, you know, may have to make some rapid regulatory changes in order to, you know, keep the lights on and keep their industry going. Well, I, I, I tend to... I, I... You know, you use the word bearish, and I, I hesitate to use that, but I think, you know, I've said the visit to Japan made me more sober, and I think that that's right. Um, and I and I also, but yeah, I mean, I think that the, it, I'm just looking at the JKM price today, what is the uh, the front month is $13.35. That's for LNG delivered into the Asian market. Um, <clears throat> and then on the Henry Hub today, uh, I don't know, what is it, two uh, $2.25, something like that. So, uh, yeah, two dollars and twenty one cents. So they're paying six x almost, you know, roughly six times more for LNG into the Jap into Asia than we're paying for here in the U S. So there isn't that um, market driver in terms of the the electricity cost in Japan in the U S that there is in Japan, which is one of the reasons why you know that I think you're right to be. Uh, skeptical. I, I, I don't want to use the word bearish about the U.S. nuclear possibility because there's a lot of money and a lot of momentum behind the industry. There's just no doubt about it. But you still have this uncertainty with the NRC you know, on the regulatory front. And that was one of the questions I had when I spoke at the Nuclear Energy Institute event, which you know, the, I, I gave them my brief on being in Japan and told them what, you know, how I see this lack of energy transition and what's really happening in the world. And one of the questions was, well, where do you see the biggest hurdle? I said, it's regulatory certainty. You don't have any regulatory certainty here in the U.S. on these different SMRs that are being proposed. And until, unless or until you get more certainty, and, and, and there's also market risk, right? Because we're of a saturated market and you're competing against heavily subsidized solar and wind. I mean, if I was a developer and I was wanted to build power plants, would I build nuclear or would I build solar and wind? I'd go follow the damn money. I mean, you know, you, there's so much more subsidy available for wind and solar. You, you, you know, I'm not saying you'd be foolish not to build nuclear, but there's a lot more enticements to build either gas or solar and wind. Right. No, I, I think nuclear in the U.S. is just too much of a nice to have, not, not a need to have. It is good seeing that, I mean, 
Indian Point being an exception there, um, that plants do seem relatively safe from premature shutdown now. Um, there's been, you know, talking about sobriety, I think uh, this most recent little energy crisis, as, as small of an impact as it had on the U.S., um, has brought some sobriety to the political class. Beautiful seeing Gavin, Gavin Newsom in the control room at Diablo Canyon. <laughs> and maybe they reopen Palisades, right? Yeah. You know, that yeah. maybe that happens. But the NRC, to their credit, just a few weeks ago, uh, said that they will extend... Uh, what did they have? It was like license. It was like they said, I forgot the term of art they used, uh, but it was uh, they're going to allow Diablo Canyon to stay open while they apply for license extension. But before they were saying, no, 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 King's X. We said but 2025. That's, be, that's because it is a, that is that's because California's got itself into such a mess with its grid planning that Diablo oh, Canyon yeah. is a need to, is a need to have, not a nice to have, right? Yeah, and, and that's a- where I think you see some wiggle room in terms of uh, you know the regulatory body's uh, behavior. And isn't that, isn't that interesting that maybe it is that the NRC is influenceable and can be influenced by, <clears throat> by hard politics? And uh, I'll plug my Substack one more time, robertbrice.substack.com. I have a new piece out on California called California Screaming uh, that last year alone, residential prices in California went up 15%. The, since 2008, when Arnold Schwarzenegger signed the renewable energy mandate in California, demand, mandating that the utilities, it was an executive order. The led to the assemblies never passed any of these mandates. They've all been by administra- the administrative state or the governor. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. Then 2018, the legislature did um, amp up the, 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 the requirements. But the uh, electricity rates in California have gone up 80%. It's high, a bigger percentage increase than any other state in the United States. And all of it has coincided with these, this ratcheting up of these renewable energy mandates. And so, you know, had they closed Diablo, the rates would have gone through the roof. I mean, the rates are exploding. I mean, they're absolutely, as, to use Mark Nelson's line, absolutely exploding. And it's going to get worse. These, these prices, these electricity prices, which are all regressive, they're going to go yet higher in California because of the, they painted themselves into a corner with this uh, renewable energy in- insanity. I don't know another word for it. I mean, I'm struck by, uh, in, maybe you have an idea of what power prices are like in Japan, but I mean, just in terms of those uh, Asian market spot prices compared to Henry Hub, um, you know, how can heavy industry compete? And it does seem like a lot of that industry may come and localize itself, you know, where, where the gas is cheap. Um, and they can't necessarily do that in Russia because of sanctions, but they sure could do that uh, in the U.S. Um, so interesting to see if that's a that's in the cards. Yeah, well, I mean, this is one of the big threats that that you know for Japan that that cost of electricity is key, and that it was one of the reasons why uh, TEPCO is building this coal plant in the middle of Tokyo <clears throat> because power prices in Tokyo, where uh, you know the, the mo- most Japanese live, it's m- most heavily densely populated, one of the most densely populated cities in the world. Power prices in Tokyo were very high. I don't know the exact number, Chris, 30, 40 cents a kilowatt hour, if memory serves. But that's one of the reasons why they're building a coal plant there, because they needed that generation capacity close to the to the population center. And so Tokyo residents were paying very high prices relative to people in Kyushu or other places that are, you know, remote from Tokyo. So again, this is energy realism. And this is the, you know, the the Japanese are nothing if not practical. And so what I saw, and as again, you know, it, it really made me, excuse me, <coughs> pause my thinking, really be, um, question my assumptions about the future of nuclear. And by seeing it through the Japanese lens and seeing that, well, then how does this apply to the U.S.? And that fuel part of it and the regulatory pr- part of it, both of them were just very much underscored by the by that visit. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> it kind of boggles the mind thinking about you know the number of coal cars that would need to make their their way into the city uh, to this supercritical coal plant. I mean, it's it's wild. I mean, it just seems like such a step backwards, not just from a climate perspective. Well, it's right on the water. They're going to bring that coal in by gotcha, water, right? Gotcha. Because okay. so it's it's the harbor. I've forgotten the name of the harbor there, but yeah. You know, okay. Tokyo's got a big, ex- extensive harbor network. So it's going to come in. It's going to be seaborne coal, probably from Australia, I'm guessing. Um, the, uh, the Japanese import a lot of coal from Australia. Right, right. Well, Robert, I think we'll park it there. Um, but thank you for the uh, travel diaries. Um, great to get a, a sense, again, just from your descriptions of the, the Fukushima site and, and your insights. Um, on our side, uh, we do have a great episode. I think it's called Sayonara Nuclear. Um, and that's with Yuri Humber. Um, it was recorded probably two years ago now, but, um, I was just re-listening to it in preparation for this interview. And it's one of my 
uh, I think, <laughs> great achievements. Uh, beautiful country profile. Um, Robert, sounds like you're going to be covering Japan a bit more as well. Um, but thank you for, uh, for coming on Decouple and, and sharing your recent experiences. Always a pleasure, Chris. And Robert Bryce at Substack.com. That's it. Thank you very kindly. Yes, right. robertbrice.substack.com. Sign up. Uh, it's free. Uh, having great fun on Substack. And I know you're on Substack now as well. So yeah, it's I've really enjoyed being on that. A lot of freedom there and uh, uh, able to publish what I want, when I want, how I want, which is uh, a great luxury. Yeah, in this world it is. Okay, Robert. Beautiful. Talk to you soon. Thank you.